afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this session around setting up multi-tenant Kafka on Kubernetes with Istio at ASML. So maybe the first question to ask is what is ASML? Because we've been approached many, many times on our booth on the ground floor uh, the past couple of days. So hopefully after this talk, you know what ASML is and why we should attend, you know, a open source subject like this one. I'm Thomas, I'm leading a team uh, that does uh, a digital transformation at ASML and we're building a common digital platform. I will provide you some context around ASML and our transformation program, and then I will hand it over to Dominic. He will introduce himself uh, after my, my first introduction. So he will be the content that will be the context. The agenda is uh, a, a small introduction of ASML, and then the common digital platform, and then basically we dive into the depth of, of uh, the implementation of Kafka, the multi-tenant implementation of Kafka. So introducing ASML, maybe a show of hands, although it's hard to see here, who knows ASML, or better, who doesn't know ASML? <laughs> hey, there's still some hands, so you, you didn't reach the booth uh, downstairs. <laughs> So ASML is basically uh, the chip making equipment company. We provide our uh, solutions, our litography solutions towards the big chip making companies like Intel, Samsung, Micron, TSMC, et cetera. NVIDIA, of course, not to forget. So basically our equipment is used to create chips. That's our core business. And we're, uh, I think the, the top, high-tech company in Europe right now, and basically we have a global presence. So looking at what's happening currently in the world, and it's, it's fast changing, you just see the, the connected world, the hyper-connected world, we all use mobiles, and every mobile device has a chip, and basically those chips are produced by our customers using our equipment. There's a lot of climate change involved, and basically it's around sustainability because the production process of chips is, is something, you know, that can be addressed with a lot of, you know, attention regarding bringing down the power that's used in that process. But basically our solution also solve our solution in a broader context of chip industry, the semiconductor industry, how to solve those big challenges of, of human mankind. And last and not least, it's the social and e economical uh, uh, changes that are happening. And ASML was uh, in the news quite often, quite recently, due to the export controls by the US towards uh, China. So that's a context. But Moore's law, because that's basically what we do, so we shrink, shrink things. So basically we make sure that many, many transistors can fit into a chip. So we try to drive and then continue uh, Moore's law in the mega trends that are happening. Either it's on cloud, it's on 5G, the connected infrastructure, AI. I mean, it's a buzzword, uh, but it basically it drives our industry. It really drives our industry. It's not only used within our own company, but basically it's driving the demand for chips. Intelligent edge, so mostly also things that are happening on the edge. And I will talk some more about what the edge means for us as ASML because our customers run their fa factories basically in an air gap fashion so they don't have and don't allow connectivity, connectivity towards the cloud. That's all due to the intellectual property. So the intellectual property of our customers, the intellectual property of ASML. Gaming simulations are just many, many, many trends that really drive the need for more, more chips. Either it's CPUs or memory or GPUs, it's, uh, these are the key trend drivers for us as a company. So lithography is critical for shrinking transistors. And basically, if you look at the manufacturing process of the value chain, so we're only just a part of them, a piece of, of the whole value chain of uh, semiconductor, we're in the manufacturing part. And our equipment are the only equipment where per wafer, so basically, these are those flat, flat pancakes where all the chips are printed on via extreme ultraviolet light or deep ultraviolet light. We're the only company where uh, basically per die in the uh, high sophisticated automated process of our customers, 
we basically eliminate the wafer die for die, so basically for in layer for layer for each and each chip. If you look at the ASML, innovation uh, is happening since 1984 when our company was founded, basically from an outcome, an offspring of, of Philips. Um, all major chip makers use our equipment. Uh, we basically have two kinds of equipment, the deep ultraviolet machines and the extreme ultraviolet machines. On the extreme ultraviolet machines, we're kind of virtual monopolists uh, on a global scale. So there's one company that has achieved to basically use extreme ultraviolet light, so that 30.5 nanometer wavelength to produce chips. That's us at a, at a scale uh, that is required by the semiconductor industry. So producing the amount of wafers that are required by all, all kinds of all the trends I just mentioned. Um, we're the biggest tech company, high tech company in Europe from a market cap perspective. And looking at our annual R&D budget, it's approximately four billion. And we have to basically constantly involve uh, and evolve the R&D within the company. And we do that with partnerships with companies like Zeiss, who produces mirrors and lenses, but also with universities, with other companies. It's, it's like the open source summit here. There's so many different you know, companies coming together that's basically what's also happening at, at ASML. So on a, I mentioned we have a global presence. Currently, and end of, of last year, our headcount was 42,000 employees. We're basically positioned for growth, uh, and we expect to double the amount of employees uh, in the years to come. We already bought a new basically campus uh, in the Netherlands, because our company is based in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands, close to technical universities because of R&D needs. But we have also presence in the United States, in Asia as well. On innovation, and I just uh, used a couple of examples of what we do and why you know, uh, open source relates to this year. Here, you see the source side of uh, our equipment. The source is basically a laser that fires uh, a laser beam towards a tin droplet, and it does it 50,000 times per second to produce plasma, to produce uh, ultraviolet light. This is here is uh, uh, the, the current state, and we will move towards 100,000 uh, droplets per second in the years to come. So there is a constant uh, evolvement of R&D involved to basically produce more light, more efficiency, more power to produce more and more wafers to guarantee the yield of our customers. Another example is the mirrors that we use in our extreme ultraviolet machines. These are produced by, by Zeiss. But if you look at the, the accuracy of those mirrors, if you would extend one mirror towards the size of Germany, then the differences in the height is only one millimeter. millimeter. That's basically the level of, of accuracy our company has to deal with. The EUV sensor itself, although we're talking about nanometers, it's a huge machine. It's a huge machine, 180,000 uh, uh, kilograms. It's, it's, like it's mentioned here, 140 uh, BMW minis. It took 20 years, basically, of R&D to evolve such a machine to produce uh, a wafers based on extreme ultraviolet light. It contains uh, a tons of sensors, and it will produce a ton of data, like four terabyte, five terabyte, and it's, it's growing because also the amount of, of new sensors and additional sensors in our machines will grow over time. So data and insight into those data is extremely important. By the way, uh, we used like, like three triple four sevens uh, big planes to basically ship one, one machine. And our customers have multiple machines in each and every FAP, and they have multiple FAPs as well. In order to basically uh, deal with the data and all the insight analytics, we were using uh, technologies uh, next to the scanners into their FAPs. 
we collected the data of the scanners to, for two kind of purposes. One is to help our customers on the production process of the wafers, and the other is how to measure the performance of our equipment. Does it behave accordingly towards the requirements of our customers? And that's where the digitalization really kicks in. What we have done in the past is basically building point solutions for customers, applications that basically support their processes in the alignment and overlay measurements of wafers. Uh, but digitalization is, is providing a lot of new opportunities to us and also expectations from customers. Customers want to access the data. They want to secure the data. You have to imagine that IP is basically embedded into the data. It's embedded into the algorithms that are used on the scanner and on digital platforms, basically, that support the wafer process uh, uh, in AFAP. So we had to basically rethink how we're going to basically manage this here at scale. At scale, on a global level, and every customer has different requirements. There's no single machine out there which is the same. So it's a lot of configurations, a lot of data. And we had to come up with a solution that basically scales and provides uh, the, the automation it needs in order to, to, to also provide customers a, a uh, healthy yield. So driving down costs by automating, quality is extremely important and security uh, is absolutely becoming more and more critical. In the past, we considered the FAPs like, like a parameter-based approach. These are highly secured environments, but more and more uh, our customers require us to basically secure the whole supply chain. So anything that gets deployed into a FAP needs to be secure. So that's basically what my team does and is focusing on, deliver a solution that basically can scale and it also supports the collaboration with our customers while it's protecting the IP of multiple parties. So this year is basically the value chain within the FAP. And uh, we play a position in computational lithography, and that means basically we have sophisticated algorithms to help chip producers and chip companies like Apple, who designs the chips, uh, to basically produce a wafer uh, that's a mask um, um, on the machine that gets illuminated and then basically is printed onto the wafer. So that's computational lithography. ASML has solutions, also product offerings towards customers. The main, and that's the core of a company, of course, are the lithography machines, the UV and EUV, the deep ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet machines. But there's a constant uh, path, of, uh, path of, of measuring. So the results of wafers uh, will, will get you know, measured because if there's a alignment or an overlay error, uh, a customer can basically scrap their, their wafers. So there's also a, a constant feedback loop towards the scanners from those measurements. And each and every step could influence the quality of the wafers. So basically data analytics and a constant feedback towards the, the source, basically towards our scanners is extremely important. That's why we defined a new digital platform strategy and a data foundation to enable this year. And this needs alignment with all our customers because, um, again, protecting data, access to data, extremely important. Collaboration is absolutely key, but we have to safeguard our IP, so in a mutual fashion. And this is basically our evolution. So we defined a strategy where we come from the current stage with a lot of silent solutions towards a more commonality-based solution path. That's a, a architecture roadmap where we decoupled basically the applications that run on top of our platforms. And these are ASML applications, but could also be our customer applications to leverage basically such a digital infrastructure and the same counts for data. So we did decouple the applications and we set up a, uh, a way where we can basically configure different kind of platform types depending on what kind of use cases they need to be supported uh, based on common building blocks. That's uh, the basically the task and the assignment that we got from, 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 uh, from senior management. 
and the content will be explained by, by Dominique soon. If you now look at this picture here, um, the in the center basically with uh, the, the dark blue box, there's the Common Digital Platform and Data Foundation. That's basically our responsibility. On the vertical axis are basically the, the kind of use cases uh, that we identified with any customer context. So basically that's a also internal alignment with engineering teams how to also transform their applications to take and leverage uh, the, uh, the platform underneath. So we say we just uh, um, embrace the platform engineering principles. We provide golden path towards our application engineering community. Uh, ASML has a lot of software engineers uh, internally, so they don't need to worry about the security. Uh, we provide security guardrails. We make sure that the capabilities they need in order to do their they're little-based analytics. Uh, they don't need to worry about the more platform engineering uh, well, complexity. And for this, I would like to hand it over to Dominic to basically deep dive into uh, our digital platform and especially around Kafka. Thank you, Thomas. So, um, before I actually move on to Kafka, I want to give you uh, a bit of a technical overview of how is this common digital platform built up. Uh, it's a classical layered architecture and really at the bottom you have Kubernetes and we're not picky which Kubernetes we get. Uh, as long as it's CNCF certified, we're happy. Why is that? Because we are going to deploy instances of this common digital platform in many different contexts. We will have it in the cloud, in uh, Google Cloud, we will have it in Azure. We will also have it on-prem at different customers, maybe even on different kinds of hardware. Uh, so we just want to be as flexible as possible. On top of Kubernetes, we install a bunch of extensions, and I think you will know most of them. We use Flux for GitOps because we are strong believers in uh, the idea of declarative configuration management. Uh, Cert Manager serves as our PKI. And then Capsule is probably somewhat less well known. Uh, it's a really cool project, so if you don't know it, check it out. It introduces the concept of multi-tenancy uh, in Kubernetes, and it gives you the concept of a tenant really at the Kubernetes API level. And that is the basis of all the multi-tenancy work that we built on top. We use the Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper as an admission controller to do uh, stuff like enforcing pod security policies. We have Istio, the service mesh, which you heard a lot about over the past few days, I guess. Um, we use it for a lot of different things, but most relevant for this talk is that it provides us with automated mutual TLS for each uh, network connection within the platform. So all data in the platform is encrypted and mutually authenticated. And for that, Istio makes use of the spiffy uh, standard for workload IDs. And basically, if you don't know that, again, something very interesting to look up. It's basically a secure way to provide every workload on your platform with an unforgeable identity that is then encoded in a client certificate and that you can use to basically do a bunch of authentication uh, stuff all throughout your platform. On top of this layer, we have what we call the shared data store layer. Um, so we have a bunch of different data storage technologies. We have streaming data with Kafka. We have relational data with Postgres. We have data lakehouse type things with Iceberg. And what is slightly uncommon or remarkable is that we built a unified data governance and access control layer on top of those different technologies. Why did we do that? Well, Thomas already mentioned it. Uh, ASML itself has a lot of trade secrets, a lot of data that is super uh, highly sensitive from an IP standpoint going through those platforms, but also ASML's customers. Uh, foundries like TSMC don't really like it when the details of their two nanometer processes uh, spill out onto the street. And the customers' customers like Apple also don't really like it when the details of their upcoming chips uh, go out in the public. So there's a lot of reason why we want to know exactly which data is on, in all of those uh, data stores, uh, who owns that data, what is the level of sensitivity, and that we can enforce strict access control on that. Now, the top layer is actually the business logic. 
You could say that the bottom three layers don't really care about what the meaning of data is. They just handle data as bits and bytes that need to be shuffled around. The top layer does know and does care about the meaning of that data. You have different use cases there, analytics, diagnostics, process control. And they all need different kinds of data from the shared data stores. And the principle of least privilege basically dictates that they should get access to exactly the data they need, no more, no less. So and the hook we use for that is basically that multi-tenant system that Capsule introduces. Each of those use cases gets their own tenant, and that tenant provides them with an identity, and we can use that identity then in the uh, access control policies that we have to say, all right, this tenant, the analytics tenant, gets access to this and this data, but not that data, for example. Um, now, multi-tenancy is about more than just providing a workload with an identity. It's very much about isolation as well performance isolation. You do not want uh, tenants to suffer from noisy neighbors. Also, basically, visibility isolation. And tenants have a right to a certain amount of privacy. We don't want noisy tenants that peek into what you are doing. Um, in our case, we take this pretty far. Basically, our tenants cannot communicate with one another over the network. This is all shielded off. They cannot communicate. Nevertheless, they need to collaborate because ultimately you are working together to build those cool chips. Um, how do we do that collaboration? Entirely through that shared data storage layer. So a tenant that needs to share some data with another tenant needs to write it into the shared data layer. We'll go through access control to see whether he's actually allowed to produce this kind of data. And then the other tenant can read it from there. And we'll also have to go through access control so we can strictly control which data is shared with whom in this case. And the final aspect of uh, multi-tenancy that I want to highlight is the self-service aspect. What we try to do is basically shift left a lot of the responsibilities towards those tenants themselves. We want to give them a lot of agency. So basically what we do is we give them a resource budget on the platform and the necessary credentials so that they can manage their own workloads. And then basically they are totally decoupled from the life cycle of other tenants and from the life cycle of the underlying platform, which improves their agility and helps them uh, move products faster to market, which used to be a pain point for ASML software. So, but I did promise you a talk about Kafka, right? So finally we arrive at the meat of the matter. And the rest of this talk is about how we actually built Kafka into this uh, data, shared data storage layer. And we promised you precisely a talk about painless multi-tenant Kafka. And what does painless mean? Well, that means different things for different people. For us as developer, painless amongst others means that we want to use a vanilla Kafka. We do not want to fork the code because if you start forking code, that's a maintenance nightmare that is far from painless. Also, we want to make sure that the rest of the Kafka ecosystem works out of the box with whatever setup we have, stuff like KSQL, Kafka Streams, etc. They make certain assumptions, for example, about a topic organization, and we have to take care that we do not deviate from those assumptions because otherwise you need to start patching Kafka Streams to make it work again in your particular use case, which sucks. We try not to do that. So we also want to make life better for our operators. So we want something that is well integrated with the platform itself. We want a Kubernetes native feel to this whole story. We want to have declarative configuration that fits well with the whole GitOps thing that we're doing. And we want to make life easy for our tenants as well. Uh, on the one hand, that's the whole self-service story. We want to, do, uh, to allow them to do their own topic management, for example, so that they don't need to negotiate with a system administrator about every new topic that they need to create. But also, and this is something that we learned from experience, we built a couple of those platforms in the past. Uh, typically, to authenticate to Kafka, to have access control, you need to jump through some hoops. You need to acquire a client certificate. You need to get a SASL password and username or connect to an LDAP or something. All of which is painful and all of which turns out to be a big barrier for our tenant developers. So we are trying to find a way to avoid all that to give them an authenticated, strictly access controlled access to Kafka without needing to go through all of those hoops. So we actually did it, but how did we do it? There were a number of challenges and I'm going to take you through all of them. Challenge number one is basically just getting Kafka to run on Kubernetes. That used to be a royal pain in the backside, as they say, because Kafka actually predates the whole modern container orchestration platform ideas. 
Kafka is really still built as an old style server application that expects each broker to be deployed on a dedicated server where that server is administrated by an admin that will cater to all of the needs of that particular broker and particular configuration of that broker and stuff like that. Very much treating a Kafka broker as a pet instead of as cattle, which is what Kubernetes really wants you to do. And all of your workloads are interchangeable, nameless, faceless, and basically worthless. You can kill one and another will pop in its place. Kafka doesn't like that when you do that. Luckily, thanks to Kubernetes operators, a lot of that pet sitting that you need to do can now be automated. And if you look in the market, there are three big names there that actually provide you with Kubernetes operators for deploying and managing Kafka. Strimzy is the biggest name. I think it's a project that was originated by, or it maybe is still even backed by Red Hat. It's very big, very comprehensive. Uh, it does not only Kafka, but also Zookeeper, Cruise Control, Kafka Connect, Mirror Maker, you name it, they've got it. The big downside for us is that they explicitly say, well, we don't care about Istio. Strimzy doesn't work well with Istio. And as you recall, Istio is one of the base technologies that we use in our platform, so that's a bit of a bummer. It's also a very complicated project, more than 200,000 lines of Java code, so quickly diving in and adding in Istio support turns out to be not so easy. Too painful for us. The second contender in this space is K-Operator, and that is, in many aspects, the diametric opposite of Strimzy. Instead of being a big, sprawling Java corporate project, it is a very small, very focused operator that, in the, the philosophy of Unix, basically does one thing, but does it well. It just sends up a Kafka cluster for you, and it can do an upgrade of that Kafka cluster, but it will not do anything more. No Kafka Connect, no Mirror Maker, no nothing, but it integrates very well with Istio. It's a very nice, tight code base, written in Go, which is a language I like a lot more than Java, to be honest. Um, the big downside for this one is uh, K-Operator was created by a very small company called Banzai Cloud. Those have since been acquired by Cisco, and you may have some experience with this in the past as well. If you have small companies with cool open source projects that get swallowed by big corporates, it's not always certain that that project will survive. Now, in this case, because it is small and very well written, we think, worst case, it's open source, if the worst happens and gets abandoned, we can take over maintenance of this. The third option there, Confluent Operator. Confluent is the company that was founded by basically the inventors of Kafka, so it stands to reason that they have the most comprehensive feature set. Their biggest downside for us is that they are a closed source company. Basically, this is a closed source solution, which means if something breaks, we can't fix it. And we really like that agency that if stuff breaks, we can dive in and fix it, especially with the ever-increasing focus on security, zero vulnerability style things. If you cannot dive in and fix it yourself, that becomes an operational problem. Also, Confluent really, really, really wants to push you towards their Confluent cloud offerings. So who knows how long that on-prem Confluent operator will still be around, we don't know. So based on all of that, I think you already heard it coming, K-Operator is the one we chose. So now, we have a Kafka running on our Kubernetes. That's great. The next challenge that we need to fix is how can we, in a painless way, allow our clients to authenticate to that Kafka? And it turns out that the combination of Istio and those spiffy workload IDs is very convenient there. Let me first illustrate this with a simpler example. So what you have here is a web server and a web client, both of them running on our platform, each in their own namespace uh, with their own service account. A uh, client does an HTTP GET and gets a 200 OK response. If you bring Istio into the mix, what you get is actually something more like this. So Istio deploys sidecar proxies next to each of the workloads. Those proxies intercept all network traffic and wrap it with mutually authenticated TLS. So all traffic is encrypted, which is awesome. And also, you have identities on both sides. Those are those spiffy workload IDs that you see there. So they identify the cluster, uh, in this case, cluster.local, that is the default name for your cluster. They identify the namespace of the workload and they identify the service account. So that's enough to basically say, this is the identity of this workload. Now, you have those certificates 
as long as you have TLS. So you have them basically between those two proxies, not in the server itself, because by then you have unwrapped the TLS, so all knowledge about that certificate is gone. Istio helps you there by basically on the server side rewriting your HTTP GET request, adding in an additional header, and in that header you can find your spiffy ID of the client that connects to the server. So basically, a server gets client authentication totally for free. The only thing it needs to do is look at that header and it will have an unforgeable, verifiable identity that it can use for audit logging, for access control, for anything you want. This is a super cool story. Unfortunately, it breaks for Kafka because Kafka is not HTTP. So there is no header line that you can add. So the knowledge of who that client is basically stops again at the Istio proxy and not in the Kafka broker where you need it for your authentication and authorization. We didn't want to give this up. So turns out that Istio proxy itself, which is basically just Envoy, can be extended. You can put your own plugins in there. So it's basically organized as two pipelines. You have the downstream path that takes in data that comes from upstream, uh, decrypts it, receives it, decrypts it, does all kinds of authentication, then delivers it to your uh, workload, and then the other way around, same thing. And you can put your own custom plugin into that path that can manipulate the data that comes in and goes out of your workload. And we use this to implement a little trick that I personally find pretty clever. So our Kafka clients are all configured to use plain text zero authentication. This is the simplest possible configuration that you can have. Why plain text? Because we have Istio to do the whole TLS encryption for us. We don't need to care about that. Uh, no authentication, also the simplest possible thing uh, that you can have. Our Kafka brokers, on the other hand, are also configured to use plain text protocol. Again, Istio will take care of the TLS, but they expect SASL authentication. So when that client connects to that broker and sends its first request over Kafka, that will obviously fail because the Kafka broker will say, you are not authenticated, I don't like you, go away. So we have this little plugin that we put in the Istio proxy at the broker side. What it does is it intercepts that first request. It extracts the spiffy ID and then on behalf of the client, does the whole SASL authentication dance. So it uh, provides the spiffy ID as a username and SASL expects you to also provide a password. We don't need a password because we already verified that identity because it came from a verified client certificate. So we just pass in a dummy password, give that to the Kafka broker. Kafka brokers don't like dummy passwords, but luckily they have a plugin mechanism a public API, so it's not forking the code. We are not breaking our own rules here. They have a plugin mechanism that you can use to plug in another authentication logic. So we created a small plugin there that basically verifies is that username indeed a valid spiffy ID? And then we ignore the password. We just tell Kafka, it's fine, it's okay. Uh, Kafka tells uh, our Istio proxy plugin, all right, you are authenticated, and that is the sign for our plugin to then finally forward the original initial request and then disengage because basically from now on this session is authenticated and our proxy doesn't need to intervene anymore. So also in terms of performance, this is pretty nice. You just break in for the very first request and afterwards you can be hands off and not care about the data flow at all anymore. So we now have a Kafka and we have authentication for our clients. Now we still need to implement proper authorization. And the first thing you always have to ask yourself with Kafka is how are we going to organize our topics? And we came up with a scheme where we have two kinds of topics. We have the shared topics that are really meant to share data among tenants. Uh, for those topics, uh, the only guy who can write to the topic is the tenant that created it. And who can read from the topic? Well, we don't know up front. That is totally defined by the data policies that are configured in that data governance layer. We create those topics always declaratively, always via a custom resource that we defined. Why? Because we enforce that next to the topic configuration itself, you also have to include a bunch of metadata about that topic, the data governance metadata that describes what is the schema of uh, this message, 
what is the, uh, the kind of the owner of the data, the sensitivity level of the data, all that kind of stuff needs to be declaratively defined when you create such a topic. On the other hand, we have private topics as well. And private topics are really meant for uh, intermediate results that are not meant to be shared outside of a single tenant. For example, if you use KSQL or Kafka streams, what they do is they make a bunch of topics behind your back to shuffle data, to filter out data, stuff like that. And it would be a right pain if you had to pre-declare all of those topics with a custom resource up front. And if you had to add uh, data governance, metadata to those things, when they are really just internal kitchen that you do not intend to share with anyone. So that's why we also have the private topics. So as you see, uh, we enforce a naming convention there with a prefix. The tenant name is part of the prefix and the kind of topic as well, S for shared, P for private. Uh, why do we do that? Uh, mainly because we want to enable the whole self-service topic creation thing. If you do not enforce some kind of namespacing on your topic names, two tenants might decide to create a topic with the same name and a different configuration, which will clash, which, will, uh, which is an, an instance of noisy neighboring. So to avoid that, we just enforce that they use a prefix there. And why a prefix? Because Kafka uh, streams and KSQL can handle fixed prefixes for their uh, temporary topics that they need to create. We used to have a different platform way back when, where we had a suffix to make stuff unique. Turns out that KSQL can't deal with a configuration that says, yeah, you need to add this fixed suffix to a topic name. And we had to patch Kafka streams for that. We do not want to do that anymore. So again, only prefixes. Take my advice on this. Now, what does the CRD look like? Basically, it's an extension of the CRD that's already part of K-Operator, so it gives you name of the topic, uh, configuration of the topic, schema for keys and values, and additional data governance information that can be used in the access control policies. Now, this gives you the shared and, and, and private topic thing, gives you a, let's say, a rough outer bound or an outer bound of what a tenant can do in terms of topics on Kafka. What data can they read? What data can they write? But I want to remind you again of the principle of least privilege. It's not because an entire tenant is allowed to read certain topics that each of the workloads within that tenant need to access all of those topics. So we need a way for a tenant to declare their intent and to say, no, this particular workload actually doesn't get access to Kafka at all or only get access to this particular topic. And how do we do that? With another custom resource, because if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, and now we can create custom resources on the wazoo. The topic access resource basically identifies a particular workload based on the tenants, namespace, service account, and then lists all the topics that they can access and what they can do with those topics. We can do wildcard matches in there, we can, we can do literals, we can say you can create or delete those topics, you can produce data on those topics, you can consume data from those topics, whatever. So what is important is that this is basically a statement of intent. This is what the tenant says, I would like this workload to do this. Of course, access to shared topics is managed not by the tenant, but by the data policy. So what happens is that we basically compare what the tenant would like with what the data policy allows. We make the intersection of those two. And based on that, we compute a set of ACLs that we then provision in Kafka. And then Kafka can further enforce the, uh, the access control. So final challenge that we need to solve is that of the noisy neighbors because you can have a very well-behaved tenant that only tries to access data that it's allowed to access, but that still breaks your entire Kafka cluster basically just by spamming a million requests a second into it. Um, luckily, Kafka has some uh, uh, provisions for that uh, with their quota system, and that quota system allows you to set limits on the amount of network bandwidth that a client can use, on the amount of CPU time that they can use on your uh, uh, network threats on your I.O. threats as a broker, uh, how many topic mutations a client can do in a certain time span, stuff like that. You can all configure that. But by default, Kafka does this accounting really on the client level. So for us, on the workload level, that would be, again, in the spirit of self-service, we do not want to have to set quota on a per workload uh, basis. We want to set quota on a per tenants basis. 
And luckily, they have another plugin API that we can abuse for that, the Client Quota Callback API. So we wrote a small plugin for that that basically does exactly the same accounting as Kafka would do, only we do it at the tenant level instead of at the client level. And then we just need to tell our system uh, what are the quota, so a system administrator can use yet another custom resource to say, hey, for tenant maintenance on this particular Kafka cluster, they can only send one megabyte per second as a consumer or as a producer or whatever. So that brings us to the final picture. This is quite a complex picture, I think, so I will take it piece by piece. First, I want to call out this little guy here. I didn't mention him before, but I did say that we have a lot of custom resources that we defined. And the counterpart of a custom resource in Kubernetes is always an operator. An operator is a piece of code that basically understands the meaning of the custom resource and that can act in the real world to make happen what you declaratively defined in your custom resource. So our operator that we wrote ourselves basically monitors all those different CRDs that we have, topics, topic access, quota, um, computes the right Kafka configuration out of that and provisions it in Kafka. That sounds like a daunting task, but actually it's not all that hard. It turns out that the entire operator that we have here is just 2,500 lines of Go code, so that's not very much. And actually, uh, roughly one third of that was actually generated for us by the a uh, super cool cube builder project, which basically you can use to generate all kinds of boilerplate for Kubernetes operators and Kubernetes managers and stuff like that. So not that hard if you ever need to do it and you need to resort to a CRD of your own, don't be afraid. It's really okay. So back to our challenges. Challenge number one, how did we get Kafka on the cluster? Well, basically thanks to K-Operator, that was really easy. You just shoot in a Kafka cluster CRD, you define the number of brokers, uh, uh, the version of Kafka that you want, and K-Operator will make sure you have your number of brokers running, and if you want to upgrade them, if you want to extend their disks, that all works declaratively and really, really nicely. Challenge number two was getting the authentication in place. Well, for that, we use the combination of Istio, those spiffy workload IDs, and two small plugins, one in the... Uh, broker site Istio proxy and went inside the Kafka broker to deal with uh, the fact that we basically fake our passwords because we don't need them. Number three was the multi-tenant data isolation and that's basically just the operator looking at all the different uh, CRDs that we have, topic access, uh, the topic definitions themselves to figure out what is the, uh, the data governance metadata, combining that with the data policy and continuously re-evaluating that if that data policy changes over time. Uh, computing a set of Kafka ACLs out of that, provisioning them into the broker, and from there on out, the broker can basically deal with stuff on its own. We don't need to care anymore. And a similar story for the quota, eh, for the, uh, the multi-tenant resource isolation. Basically, the operator picks up all the different quota CRDs we have, um, configures them in Zookeeper, and then we have our little plugin that does the accounting on the tenant level, and from there on out, everything works smoothly as it should. So, this just leaves me with some final words to impart on you. What did we actually build? We built a multi-tenant Kafka running on Kubernetes, purely based on open source technologies with some custom glue code of our own, but really not that much glue code. A small operator, two Kafka plugins, and an Istio proxy plugin. That's all we did. Uh, this perfectly fits the needs of ASML. But why do I highlight this? Because this is not the only way you can do stuff. Kafka offers you a lot of mechanism to implement multi-tenancy and zero policy. Basically, it says, here is a bag of Lego bricks you build the castle you like from it. Um, so you will need to figure out what your needs are and how you want to stack the bricks into a castle of your liking. But in all cases, we hope that the journey that we went through and the story that we told here can serve as inspiration on your own journey here. So and on the right side of the slide, there are some cool projects for you to check out. So Capsule for the multi-tenancy, the OPA gatekeeper for admission control, really cool. Um, the Istio service mesh, proxy wasm is basically the API spec uh, for those uh, Istio plugins. So 
if you write an Istio plugin of your own, uh, that project gives you the API spec, the way to hook into the upstream and the downstream path and how to manipulate it, stuff like that. K operator for bringing up Kafka and cube builder for if you want to build your own operators. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. I think we are actually out of time, but maybe I can take one question if somebody has one. Go ahead. I think the, so the question was, is this generalizable or is this really very specific to the ASML context? It is specific in the sense that we built this unified data access and data policy layer. And obviously we did a lot of work to integrate with that and that work is very specific to ASML. What is general, what are general takeaways you can take from this is uh, the fact that K operator is a really nice operator. Uh, the fact that this whole uh, Istio client certificates authentication story actually works also outside of ASML. If you look at uh, a trend in the industry, Spiffy and Spire is one of those things that is actually gaining some steam, especially when you start looking at zero trust networking and stuff like that. And basically what we explain here is how can you leverage that to do your Kafka client authentication. So those parts are general. The part about figuring out how you are going to configure your ACLs on Kafka with all of this stuff, that's very ASML specific, of course. All right. Thank you very much, all of you.